Good evening, everyone. My name is Connie Pascal, and welcome to MI Colloquium on this fine November 8th, 2023 day. Our guest speaker for this evening is uh, our own Sky Assistant Professor, um, Tafik Amari. Tafik's title says a lot. Twitter's extreme changes, what they mean for the future of public discourse. So a little bit of a uh, meeting information to get started. Again, video of this will be available. Uh, do stay muted. But again, we've got a small group. So I'm sure that if you have a question, um, just either raise your hand or take yourself off mute and ask it. And again, we do like a lively chat. We want to, if you want to put your questions or comments. Uh, um, I will be monitoring that. And again, we'll uh, have as much interaction as we possibly can. Here's our agenda. This is what we're doing right now. Um, Tafik's going to speak for about 35, 40 minutes. Then we're going to do a nice little Q&A and we'll have some closing comments and get you guys out on your way. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Tafik Amari. He is a mixed method researcher and a Fulbright scholar. I did not know that. That's pretty cool. Uh, his research interests uh, intersect with social computing, data science, and STS, which is science, technology, and society. Uh, and again, the focus, just per your, your CV, is to promote equity and progressive social change online, which we certainly need. So again, uh, Tafik's research, again, focuses on the interplay of technology and societal change, which again, social media certainly has had that uh, effect. Uh, he studies the impact of changing norms such as masculinity on online interactions and social movements. He investigates how technologies like social media and voice assistance influence domestic and social roles. Uh, his PhD is from University of Michigan in information science. He's also got his master's degree from there and a uh, bachelor's in computer engineering from the University of Jordan. He is a member of two labs, the Behavioral Inform Informatics Lab and Computational Social Science Lab. And with that, I will stop sharing and give it over to Tafik. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Connie, for the Awesome introduction. Um, oh, great. Okay, it's sharing. Can you guys see the slides? I'm hoping. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so let's let's get into it. All right. So I'm gonna start with the Arab Spring, um, partially because um, that was one of the things that really got me interested in um, social media and and um, and social interaction generally. Um, that was around, so, so Arab Spring was happening around the time uh, that I got to the States and started my master's degree. And um, a lot was written back then um, about how important Twitter and Facebook were for these uh, revolutions. And, and, and you can make a very good argument that it was, of course. Um, so uh, some of the, um, example uh, images that I like that kind of bring that to the fore is uh, this one that says revolution tools, um, not the AK-47 or the machete, but Twitter and Facebook. Um, the one on the left um, in Arabic, it says NAS book, which means the people's book, right? So not, not just Facebook. Um, and these are both, uh, these were both in uh, Tahrir Square in, in Cairo. Uh, around the time of of the um, social movement there, so you know I think it's worth it to kind of remember when Twitter was first kind of seen as um, the uh, engine of social change, um, and I see and I say was seen as the engine of social of change. Oh, sorry, was seen as the engine of social change because I think the story was not. Uh, um, uh, complete in those in 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 the way that it was told. We were basically told you we were basically kind of constantly uh, um, the news basically always brought it up as a as a positive. You know, Twitter, the revolution, it's great. But you know, I do want to kind of we, we're we're all information professionals, and I think we should always. Um, contextualize and, and um, complicate uh, any social effect of technology, including something like Twitter and Facebook. 
Um, one of the one of the things that I think we can bring to the fore is the same tools were used in in Egypt, and the same tools were used similarly in Syria and in Lebanon and, and in Libya. And I would, you know, uh, uh, draw it to your attention to the fact that the changes that happened in Tunisia and Egypt were largely peaceful and led to a, to a change. Um, but in Syria and in Libya, of course, um, kind of collapsed into uh, armed uh, armed struggle. Um, and so, you know, the, the question of whether or not a technology uh, um, is useful is needs to always be contextualized. Uh, and I think that's our job um, as, as people who study information science and, and not just the technical tools themselves. Um, if you want to know more about the complex nature of the use of Twitter and Facebook in, in, in social movements. I think one of the people who did a, an excellent job at kind of balancing that argument is Morozov um, in the net delusion. Um, um, I think Morozov is, is one of the best uh, uh, kind of, uh, um, so one of the better um, authors about about specifically about the the power of the power and the limits of, of social media in 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 social movements okay so but one of the things that, that I, again I think we need to be on the forefront of understanding is as um, information uh, professionals and um, and academics is um, the question of of uh, affordances right and those you know most of you I guess would have seen uh, some form of this. This is Don Norman, uh, one of the uh, top uh, uh, professionals in, in design. And he kind of um, defines affordance as the term, uh, as uh, the term affordance refers to the relationship between a physical object and a person. And of course, since then, we've built a lot on top of that. Uh, it's not necessarily just a physical object. It's whatever the technology affords you. Right, so it's the relationship between the feature. That's the difference between the word feature. The relationship between the feature and how people actually use it in, in daily life. So to give you an example that I use in my class, right, the different technologies that we use daily are kind of, you know, designed in a way that affords their use in a particular way. You know, you see a, a button and you push. You see a switch and you flip. You see a knob and you rotate. Right, you don't have to think about it. Um, uh, now, of course, uh, social media affordances are not exactly um, that straightforward. However, the idea is still the same. You have a feature, you use it for a particular purpose, and it allows you to do specific things. Okay? Um, the, the, the other way to think about technology generally and, and its interaction with, uh, with um, people um, is uh, one of there are many different ways of thinking about it, but one of them is actor network theory. And the reason I bring it up is, again, you need to think about the fact that there are both human and non-human actors, and they act differently, right? Um, but they their interaction is what we need to be looking at. And this is, you know, an example. It is not a universal way of looking at things. But again, you know, you look at a technology, you know, going through. If you look at the uh, uh, top left area, right? Applications and icons and the graphical user interface itself is an actor, it is a non-human actor that intersects with the user. If you start thinking about how that relates to, to social media, it kind of expands, right? It's not the graphical user interface itself, but rather how we see our social interactions through the graphical user interface. And we'll give some examples now about Twitter specifically, but again, it applies to any social media site, but in different ways. So one of the main features of, of Twitter that actually, one of the main affordances, since we start using that word, um, that actually came up as a, as a uh, you know, historically was a kind of a, um, a mistake. It wasn't something that Twitter, um, it happened, it was happenstance. It wasn't something that Twitter created at the beginning, but it's the hashtag, right? And the idea here is like, while there is no specific community within Twitter, as 
compared to something like Facebook groups or The Well, we were just talking about one of the earliest online communities. Um, the hashtag became this virtual community, right? We, we all know if we want to talk about a specific thing, we're just going to look for that hashtag. And of course, the next thing that came up is the idea of you know, something becoming important, trending. And the way that it would be trending is, of course, complex. But basically, if a lot of people in different social networks and different um, locations within the network itself were quote tweeting it or retweeting it, then and liking it, then then that thing, or the hashtag, um, would become trending. And and you know, uh, I know lots of people uh, like to say that uh, Twitter isn't real life or you know social media isn't real life, um, but in some ways it it totally is. Um, if you have a lot of journalists who are on Twitter and for whom these trending, um, uh, uh, you know, the trends, whatever is trending, is part of their daily diet, um, then they these journalists are going to write about it. And by definition, that's going to amplify whatever is happening on Twitter through the traditional channels that we usually go through. And so, you know, um, again, we have to consider how technology is kind of in this liminal space. It's not technology. It's a so it's a socio-technical system. It is about how people socially engage with it. Um, so I'm just going to kind of give you a few um, ideas based off of um, some of the work that, you know, I had done um, uh, specifically about how uh, Twitter has been used was being used by people and this is this goes back to a, an early paper paper with um my advisor in uh, in uh, in michigan 2015 and we were studying the use of social media by parents of children with special needs right and we were very um uh, uh, flexible about what special needs were we weren't focusing on a specific um kind of special needs. It wasn't just like autism or ADHD or anything like that. It was it was an open um, space. The The concept here, the, the idea is to see how parents of children who are marginalized in some way were using social media. And also we were open and flexible in what social media sites they were using. So one of the things we found is that, you know, there are lots of parents told us that they would start talking about some of these issues on Reddit or on Facebook groups, places that are not necessarily open to everyone and they're not kind of broadcasting. And they would start discussing things that they considered problematic in um, the way that their children were having access to services or the lack of access to services um, and what they thought needed to change. And they would organize on these in these closed communities but then when it comes time to advocate for change and basically target you know politicians in their areas or in their in their geographical areas or in their states um then they would use twitter because twitter by definition is the social media site that allows them to amplify their voice um, into into the ether right like send it out right and, and kind of get to your your congressman or your senator or, uh, or or whatever that you know generally you probably can't get access uh, you know access them on a on a regular basis um and so you know this is great because it gives us an example of how the different affordances of different social media sites were used to affect to allow people to um to empower parents to kind of make social change um by using some of them for organizing and kind of setting together what the strategy would be and others for actually implementing the um, political uh, strategy using Twitter. The other cool thing about this is that people talk about very deeply um, personal things, a lot of times in jest, um, uh, on Twitter in a way that's kind of interesting and weird right so this this tweet uh says my husband and i decided we don't want to have children we will be telling them tonight <laughs> um and and you know i i at the time studying um parenting was very interested in seeing how people were discussing parenting on different social media sites to 
uh, you know, to varying effects. And while most of my work has been uh, on um, other communities, specifically Reddit, that was the focus of, of my work and, and Facebook groups, um, Twitter was also kind of interesting in the sense that parents can connect with um, some um, specialists and some professionals whom um, they might not know. This is not your pediatrician, this you know, uh, or someone you know in, in a in a professional way, um, but someone whom you could trust uh, because their Twitter persona was associated associated with their professional stature. So you could also, if you study something like Twitter, you could also end up writing a paper like this, a qualitative analysis of stay-at-home parents spanking tweets. Um, and that was a, a lot of fun uh, working on this paper and kind of looking at the different ways that people talked about things like, you know, corporal punishment when it comes to your kids. And um, interestingly enough, people were, you know, parents were very open about, you know, what they, what they thought here. Um, and I think, you know, again, one of the things that make Twitter kind of interesting in this, or at least was at the time, used to make it pretty interesting in this case, is that parents were not only talking about what they thought was right or wrong, they were sharing um, other people's, a lot of them professionals view on this. And one of the main use, the main ways in which they could do that, the professionals like that they would point to the fact that this person is a professional, is that they would be verified. So I will come back to this idea in a, in, a, in a minute, but like I think that was very important. The idea that you could actually trust someone, right? Trust that they are um, uh, uh, not just uh, someone who is just, you know, riffing, um, but that they are bringing some sort of professional background to what they're saying, to what they're tweeting. Um, that was a, that was a, you know, pretty important part of the experience on Twitter and that you could trust that they are actually verified because they are bringing to bear some kind of experience. Um, and, you know, uh, later, the, this this is a paper we published a, a year ago, and it's it, it is specifically looking at feminist groups and uh, in South Asia. So we were focusing on India, um, and Pakistan. And um, while our focus was on Facebook groups, it, we did find that some of them, again, were using similar um, uh, strategies to the strategies that were used by parents of children with special needs, specifically that they would organize on Facebook groups, but then they would kind of um, um, flex their uh, political muscles on Twitter. Uh, and I, I'll give you a specific example that kind of um, stayed with me. Um, so one of the um, Facebook groups was uh, for a uh, <clears throat> for a university in Pakistan. And as was happening at the time, uh, this was around 2020, 2019, 2020, um, as was happening at the time in the U.S., there was a nascent Me Too movement uh, for women in, in Pakistan and in India um, and in other parts of South Asia. And in fact, it was global. Um, and a lot of the um, uh, female students uh, on that Facebook group that is closed and only for female students within that university started discussing um, their experiences with basically sexual assault, with specific you know, a list of specific members uh, within the faculty and administration within that university. Um, and what started to crystallize was this idea of, oh, you know, I'm not alone in this experience and that there are others like me. This slowly snowballed into organizing around another Me Too movement, specifically saying that we can that that they could not sit idly by while these same perpetrators were still in their um, positions in the university. And they actually organized around that um, and later started tweeting about it in a very strategic fashion. And I will get back to that. 
I will tell you, did like fast forward, they actually were able to do some um, um, you know, concrete changes within um, the university. Um, some of these uh, professors and professionals were, uh, and administrators were um, fired. Um, others were demoted. Um, and there was uh, a, um, a new uh, uh, committee was created um, with students as members. Um, so that uh, uh, you know, these um, there would be a channel uh, for for women within within uh, for students, uh, uh, female students within the university, to kind of be able to um, um, report on on any sexual assault, which which was not the case beforehand. Uh, it struck me as a as a, um, uh, in you know, I was wowed by the fact that there was not a process in the first place. Um, so you know, it was uh, 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 certainly uh, successful to an extent. This whole movement. All that being said, uh, this was not without its uh, failures along the way. So one of the things we found is that because this was a big enough uh, group, we're talking about you know thousands of users. Uh, one of the main problems was privacy. And while we talk about privacy a lot in this in in the states and in and in Western Europe, I do want to bring forth the idea that in some parts of the world that are more patriarchal, because I think most of the work world is in one way or another patriarchal, um, but in places like South Asia, um, the 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 loss of privacy or for some women can actually lead to grave bodily harm or even death um and one of the uh very famous um example of, examples of this is Kandil uh, uh, Balok in 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 uh Pakistan uh who was uh, murdered because of her persona and the way that she um expressed herself on 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 social media um and so you know, one of the problems that they had is that some of the information, uh, some of the discussions that were being had within this Facebook group was slowly being um, kind of released. Uh, some of it, um, uh, you know, people taking screenshots and that put some of the students in real danger, uh, danger of losing uh, scholarships, dangers of being pushed out of school, uh, danger of being, uh, you know, uh, attacked physically. Um, and so social media is not, there's no good answer at the, at the moment, technically, as to how to deal with these issues, right? Um, uh, and so, you know, again, uh, the use of technology, whilst in many ways can be quite empowering, can also be uh, uh, dangerous and in some cases uh, deadly. Uh, so uh, very, very important for us to keep in mind that whatever the technology is, it has its limitations and it can in many ways, and it does in, in a lot of examples, um, afford more power to the powerful already, right? Um, which is, which is, a, which is a, a concept called uh, technology as amplifier. Um, uh, the concept basically says that if you're someone with a lot of power already, um, technology amplifies that power. And if you're someone who is uh, uh, marginalized, it can increase your marginalization. Uh, and a lot of that, I, I don't think we need to get into that right now, although we can in the discussion, a lot of that also is a, is is kind of prevalent in in uh, AI and the way that uh, artificial intelligence kind of um, um, amplifies, again, the same kind of uh, marginalizing trends that we have in society. Okay, so moving on. Um, I, I hate to remind, oops, oops. Just a second. Speaking of technology, it locked out. Okay, great. Um, uh, so uh, I hate to uh, put everyone back in the in the COVID mood, um, but I do want to talk about the fact that another problem, of course, that social media has amplified is the problem of uh, uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, no one, I think is saying, and if any of them were, then they're wrong, that misinformation and disinformation is a new concept. The problem, of course, is that the amplification of these 
of, of misinformation and disinformation um, has gone through, it, it has become so, um, um, like Twitter has basically amplified it and made it so much easier to share misinformation, disinformation, that controlling it and managing it, managing the, the, the sharing and the amplification of um, misinformation uh, becomes incredibly important and also pretty difficult. Um, so uh, I don't know about you, I've seen this kind of message a lot uh, around the time of, of COVID. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it was one way to deal with it. But if you, as you can see, like, it's so fraught that the second half of it, of this, this message says, however, Twitter has determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. And part of the reason for this is that um, these were, this was, was the message that was attached to uh, public um, um, actors who were considered too important um, or too central uh, to kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, for their messages to be removed. And so, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an incredibly difficult um, issue to, to deal with. Um, and not at all easy to to uh, to to grapple with as we as we all know. However, you know they were trying to do something um, that uh, that allows that that would have allowed us to kind of control uh, what whatever mis, uh, misinformation was was coming out. Now moving, so you know this these kind of controls were removed later on. And, and now any misinformation about, about COVID and any other medical uh, information, especially about vaccines, is shared widely, unfortunately. Now, I do want to move to discuss, again, go back to the idea of verification. So I don't know how many of you, and maybe show of hands here, I don't know how many of you know Dave Wasserman. Um, can I sh sh show of hands in the yellow hands, just to know? Okay. Great. So Jamie does. All right. So I'll just say a, a couple of, you know, a, a little bit about Dave. Dave is, is the person to follow if you want to know, um, you know, blow by blow what's happening on, on election night, any election night. And um, Dave has a, a, a kind of a, uh, <laughs> he has a, a go-to uh, kind of um, um, phrase, which is, I've seen enough. And at that point, he will actually tell us who won, right? So if you see the one at the bottom, the screenshot at the bottom, it says, I've seen enough, Andy Bashir, this is from yesterday, uh, wins re-election, blah, 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 right? This is generally the tenor of his of his um, tweets. I do want to draw your attention to the fact that on the top, this was a tweet in 2020, 20, 2022, um, Dave is verified. We know that this is Dave. Um, when Dave says, I've seen enough, uh, you can trust that he's seen enough, and that this is the, the way he wants to call him like the, the election. Um, unfortunately, of course, uh, we all know that the ver verification process itself now um, has, has, uh, has been degraded considerably. And what we end up with is uh, uh, something more like this. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers this when uh, one of the Twitter users after the introduction of Twitter Blue um, was basically personifying Eli Lilly. Did, again, show of hands, let's try this out. How many of you remember this? Does anyone recall seeing this at all? Okay, Jamie again. Okay, we're, we're both um, um, very online people apparently. Okay, so let me just uh, quickly just go through this. Um, so around that time when uh, Elon Musk uh, took over, uh, Twitter became the the verification on Twitter um, was basically moved from uh, an application process where you would say I need to be verified because I am whatever a journalist, um, a professional of so in in some way um, or an organization to. Uh, paying a dollars and then um, having the verification um, uh, button, which again is an affordance because it says something about what that account is. And so a lot of the accounts that bought the um, the eight dollar that spent the eight dollars uh, started popping popping up that were personifying other other accounts. So Eli Lilly 
is the is the is the is the example here. And uh, the tweet says, "We are excited to announce that insulin is free now." <laughs> um, and just FYI, like I don't know, you you can go back to the. I probably should have taken a screenshot of this. Um, Eli Levy's uh, 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 um, uh, stock tanked around that time. Uh, <laughs> because of this this kind of misinformation so again like changes the changing the affordances and changing the features can have a big effect on how social media can be used so all this is to say that i i want to bring us to the idea of the of the uh, public sphere right and the public sphere is kind of an, an arena in which citizens usually that's the gem, like the original idea uh, come together, exchange opinions uh, regarding public affairs, what's happening, um, discuss, deliberate, and, and form, you know, opinions together, right? That's the public sphere. We come together, we talk. It looks something like this in the 1800s, right? The con where, when the concept started. Um, and so, you know, uh, social media in some ways provides us with something like that, something like that. I'm not going to say it's the same because it's conceptually different. Um, and 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 I think the the definition that you know social media um, uh, uh, scholars have kind of landed on, especially in, in the case of something like Twitter or any of the um, uh, clones of Twitter, as well as things like Insta, Instagram and, and definitely TikTok, is uh, something that they call the networked public. And a networked public is basically a public that is networked around something. And in this case, again, the something is the hashtag. But this network public is governed by other affordances of the social media side, not just the hashtag. It is governed by whether or not people are verified. And by definition, if they're verified, that means that they have some stature, that whatever they say holds more sway. And in fact, we know, and we, we're currently running a couple of, of studies uh, with what data, what, what Twitter data we still have, if you're verified, you are you're amplified at a way higher rate than most other people, right? So being verified matters. Um, and there are other kind of uh, uh, associations uh, when it comes to uh, um, the hashtag that are associated with homophily. So even the same hashtag, uh, people might follow um, this you know, the, those people whom they agree with, right? Which which creates these, you know, echo chambers, which we all know about. And so, you know, with the latest changes around, you know, removing the old verification process um, and having less and less uh, moderation checks, this networked public is severely limited. And I think degraded in a lot of ways. Uh, I think this information is being uh, amplified at a at a high rate in in ways that are more difficult to deal with, um, and I think one of the issues here is the stickiness of the social networks that we have on social media. It's very difficult to move your social network from Twitter to anything else. That's why it's very difficult to actually um, uh, uh, kind of create you know make another clone that that works just as well as Twitter used to. Um, even things like Threads and Blue Sky. Uh, are still not having the same kind of um, uh, traffic that Twitter does, especially internationally. So I don't only, only follow um, uh, Twitter here in the States. I also follow, follow it internationally. And Twitter is still, internationally, is still kind of the, the, the big uh, name in the game. So I'm, I'm going to stop it here and kind of uh, just, oh, sorry. I, I want to talk about misinformation here, but we did we kind of cover that. Um, I do want to kind of pose three questions uh, first to discuss, but uh, if there are an, a, anything else that people want to discuss, I, I think we can go that way. Um, three questions being, how can information professionals help develop develop better Twitters, right? Not necessarily just Twitter. And how can information professionals help people to spot misinformation, disinformation? And finally, how can information professionals help build better virtual publics? So I think... I'm going to stop here and get someone else to kind of talk or comment or ask uh, questions. All right. So for the audience again, Tafik has posed three questions for us. 
So how can information professionals help develop better Twitters, right? And that Twitters is a concept. So what do you guys think? Is Twitter... Well, so let's what let's start with um, do we think X is actually ever going to be evolve into a better Twitter? I really doubt it. I feel like the number of changes that have been made at this point um, have lost a lot of the people who found something unique in Twitter. And um, I think even if they changed everything back, there's a lot of just trust lost there. So Jamie, you were a journalist. Uh, yeah, for about seven years. Okay. And uh, was that in, did you use Twitter? Oh my gosh, yes. We pretty much were required to have a Twitter um, if we wanted to get anywhere with finding sources or pushing out our uh, stories when they were done. Um, mm -hmm. But the last place that I worked, we actually had to um, workshop all of our headlines to be uh, Twitter friendly, Facebook friendly, mm -hmm. uh, so on and so forth. Well, I personally always found that Twitter had an outsize, was playing an outsized role based on the fact that, again, its user base was so much, was considerably smaller. Uh, and it is, from what I understand, and uh, what Tafik studies is that, again, it's because journalists really went there. And we started seeing Twitter as a place where we could get, you know, we could find those experts and cognitive authorities that we could trust and believe in. Um, but as far as, you know, how this, the idea of the verification, I thought, you know, when you earned a verification, the blue check, that was one thing. But now that you have to buy it, I'm not sure that that's the case. What do you guys think? I, mean, I think the Eli Lilly example was the perfect one to show um, about how important verification was, um, you know, just to to have that kind of check uh, of balance, check and balances, I think, of trying to, you know, making sure you proved who you were. Um, and I think one of the one of the reasons I think journalists use Twitter all the time um, was to create, uh, to kind of create a connection with your audience. If you can share bits of what you're working on or like even breaking news as it's happening, then people get to feel like they're part of the story and they get to feel like they're part of building it. And that creates a community, not just of journalists, but of journalists and readers and um, information specialists and experts. And I think that community was held up by the trust that verification um, added. And since verification no longer builds that trust, um, that community has started to fall apart. So what could we do as information professionals to, um, to build trust, to support trust, to to aggregate trust. Tafik, I'm gonna ask you to jump in on this one because I think this is some of the things that you've really been studying. What's your research say? Yeah, I mean, I think there are two things to take into consideration. I think like so long as we have, so there are things we, we can't have control over, right? We, you know, we, we know who owns Twitter. That's, that's beyond our control. I think our control start like whenever we're in the design uh, space, we need to kind of bring all this into consideration where wherever we are um, uh, in a space that allows us to, um, I gotta say libraries, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, explaining to people how, what, you know, uh, information literacy and, and kind of uh, understanding how uh, to spot this information, which is not easy at all. Like everyone can, can be um, deceived, especially with, uh, with the better, like with some accounts that are really, really good at, at kind of um, crafting things in a way that looks um, real. I think, you know, I think one of the things that we should start thinking about is not just Twitter, but the thing that scares me, and I think we have no real good answers for, is the more, I mean, it, it is available in Twitter, but other social media sites are taking it to a other a higher levels, which is um, algorithmic, um, 
uh, recommendations. Uh, so basically on Twitter, the the main channel of algorithmic recommendations was the trending topics, um, especially the ones that are the, the for you part, right? But trending generally, because no one really knows what the algorithm was that kind of got things trending. But if you think about newer social media sites like Instagram and, and um, TikTok specifically, the the level of um, um, uh, um, algorithmic recommendation is is way higher, and it, it kind of it, by definition locks people into specific information channels. Um, and so, if, if if some of those are misinformation channels, then that becomes uh, um, uh, you know a real problem. Uh, I just want to answer Jamie's. Uh, well, comment on Jamie's comment, I guess. Uh, she just said, even with verification, misinformation could still become viral. Absolutely. And, and in fact, sometimes it's because of the of the verification. Um, because verification only tells you that someone has some stature. It doesn't tell you why. So it could be that I have some stature because, I don't know, I'm an actor, right? Um, and if I'm saying something about the vaccine, then doesn't mean anything. I'm, I'm an actor. I don't have any special knowledge there, but it, it could very well be um, amplified because of my stature as an actor. Uh, so I agree. I think one of the things we should do is when you're verified, you have to be verified for a specific reason. So verified health professional, verified actor, right? Uh, that kind of gives you the one, the one change that I, I actually, you know, I got to give it to him. The one change that I think uh, and I, I forgot to take a screenshot of that one for for this presentation, but I think the one change that that was actually uh, beneficial lately is the uh, the community notes. Uh, the community notes on on a lot of the uh, uh, I don't know if uh, does everyone know what community notes are. So I don't. You know, so community notes are this new feature that people can give context to a, a, a tweet and basically say this is not true. Um, here is the actual source of the information. So they, the community can kind of correct um, misinformation and disinformation that comes in. Again, highly, like it is still not perfect because people can spread misinformation, right? By saying that something is not correct and sharing their own link. But um, it does actually work sometimes. So there is that one. Well, Charles um, had a question he wanted to come on and ask. Hey guys, um, I think one of the questions was what can information professionals do to create better Twitters? Yeah. Or new Twitters. So a couple of things. One, I remember when when Twitter was was started seeing the sketch of of the concept of it uh by the founder. Um it was it was limited to 140 characters because cell right. phones at that time only allowed that many characters. So yeah. we can't really that, yeah. create the same product if you will when you don't, we don't have that limit and i remember it was big news maybe i don't know 10 years after that when they doubled the, the character count yeah, yeah. so I, I think it's still there at 280 it is 280 now yeah yeah so um i think you know in that sense twitter was a product of its time um so uh, that was what was brilliant about it it was created to use it was within, within those constraints of the cell phone at the time um but anyway um uh, the, the other thing is, I, I'm just wondering what the, uh, if if it's a feature that Twitter's kicked the FBI out, if that's an improvement. What, say a little what bit. Way? What, what, Matt Taibbi, a journalist, had, had reported, uh, reported that um, Twitter and the FBI's task force on social media corresponded a significant number of times. Where FBI, the FBI was trying to influence the moderation of Twitter content and trying to point Twitter to take down tweets. Yeah. So in that sense, they weren't, there wasn't a spread of information. There was a lack of spread of information. Yeah. Or maybe a lack of spread of misinformation as well. So, arguably, it's a feature now that Twitter is not under those um, practices. Hmm. Tafik? Maybe, uh, so I I know what I know. Matt's piece a piece is about that. He, he it's been his his thing for a year now. Um, so let me just 
preface preface this by saying the moderator person, the moderator, the the specialist in moderation is actually Shagun, and maybe Connie. That's someone who should give a talk about the stuff because he he, he this is what he does. Uh, Shagun. This is one of our other uh, Sky um, assistant professors. Mm -hmm. um, he moderates for tw for Twitter. I'm sorry. No, he say he moderates for Twitter, or he no, did no, moderate? no, moderation generally. Oh, okay, gotcha. What I will say is that there is no good answer to your question, and that is part of the the. the I I don't think that it's always a, a negative that the FBI gets to take down some information. No, because I can see a reason why they would have to. Um, that being said, I also think that um, the way that they might be doing it is not necessarily the best way because there is no public channel for us to know what's being done and why, right? Um, and so I think if 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 I were to approach this in a way that would resolve this issue, I think the way that we could think about it is that this should be a public, um, a publicly managed um, uh, entity. The fact that it's a private company um, and the fact that the moderation uh, decisions were made generally in the company um, is, from my perspective, part of the problem here. Because, you know, yeah, they made some decisions that weren't great before, and they're making some bad decisions now. And, you know, even if it was anyone who makes decisions about moderation, you're going to have a problem with, because where's the line? Where's the line between, you know... Um, you know, uh, 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 freedom of speech and protecting, you know, people, right? You know, someone saying whatever they want to say about the vaccine and someone who is a, a public health professional uh, being able to set the record straight. Where, where's that line, right? Uh, and I don't know that we have a, a good a good, a good, good answer to that. Yehuda. Uh, yes, very interesting, Tofik. Uh, I just want to, you mentioned before the AI and and my question is, do you think that uh, w with the current, um, you know, management or the current Twitter, the way it is, do you think uh, that uh, Twitter can be uh, AI industry, the AI industry can be affected by the Twitter, by Twitter? And um, in, in, in what ways and, and how can, you know, is it something serious? Is it something that we have to look at? Is it something that we have to watch out? Um, Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes to all that. Uh, I mean, it, it already is, right? So one of the things that's been on everyone's mind is chat GPT. And GPT is trained on a lot of these publicly available uh, social media data. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of those social media data sites are closing their APIs, right? Um, because they don't want uh, GPT to, be, uh, to keep reading their, uh, their data freely. And so, you know, I think... Yes, the answer to your question. Yes, any any all of these decisions are affecting those large language models and the biases within them, um, and we don't know how because again we don't know how these are being built. We don't know what kind of testing is being done. We don't know what the data set looks like, which determines the biases in the first place. So, I think again we 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 come back to the uh, um, same issue that you know you know that I referred to with Charles. And that is who controls what, right? Uh, what kind of public control, if any, whether it be public ownership or uh, uh, regulation, uh, should we be looking at? W what does that look like? So is the key to this transparency in the algorithm and is that ability to understand and translate, even describe the algorithm, is that the new skill that we as information science professionals have to develop or bring to the world? Some, I'm not sure I'm articulating it right, but it feels like there's this whole new role emerging around algorithmic transparency as part of this. You know, yes, but, but mostly through understanding data. I'll tell you, I mean, I think um, the problem here is that transparency of, in AI is, is pretty much a, still a nascent um, space. No one knows what that means. Uh, you ask, you know, five different AI, you know, specialists what transparency means, it'll give you five different answers. Um, 
there's no good answer yet. I think what we'll go back to is like, you can never have transparency if you don't know what the training data was. Right. If you know what the training data was, then you can start understanding some things about the model. Will you understand it completely? No. There are lots of things about neural networks, which is how embeddings like large language models like GPT are created that are uh, really difficult to understand even for the people who build them. Uh, this is not, you know, it's they're very complex structures. And so it's not like we, and I don't think that we need to understand that, but understanding the data that goes into it, yes, I think we should know what that is. I think we should know how it's being read. I think we should know, you know, generally speaking, what are the sources of, of the training data that they're using for anything that's being used on a, on a big on a big stage, whether it be for health, whether it be for, because think about it, if you're not including um, minority groups in that, well, well then, you know, again, you're, you're marginalizing them again, but through AI, um, whether it be for credit, uh, credit lines, whether it be for um, uh, the uh, um, uh, crime, you know, uh, determining uh, crime rates in specific re areas or uh, um there are systems now, AI systems that are assisting judges. Uh, what data are they trained on? Right, that that scares me a lot. And so I think you know people talk a lot about AI and they think about ter the like the Terminator is the thing that comes up a lot. Right. I think you know that's not what's scary. What is scary is all the social, all these systems that are dealing with you know, like social issues. Uh, be it again, like they're they're already kind of being included in in questions of giving people loans or um, again, being in the legal system. Um, and if you don't know how these decisions are being reached, you can't even determine whether they're right or wrong, whether they're fair or not, right? And so we have, we have a huge ethical issues there that are, that are not, they're not being resolved. Um, right, well, we've only got three more minutes to resolve those issues, Tuffy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Closing comment, anybody care to offer a closing comment? Future of Twitter, X, do we have to call it X? Do we still tweet or do we X now? I don't know. I think I can close by answering Virginia's question. So she asked about X and the fact that lots of people have left, a lot of people have left, <laughs> that is true. Um, and how transparency can be kept up with that. One of the main things, again, is open sourcing everything. If you had an open source view of the software that's being used, if you had a better understanding of the algorithms, then turnover does not become a problem. You you go back again to the problem of the the, the, the business model for these social media sites. And, and, and so again, I think what I started with, I'm gonna kind of wrap up, which might be a nice thing. Uh, these are not technical problems. These are socio-technical problems. Uh, whatever mm -hmm. solutions we can come up with are only solutions that can be brought in through social change as much as it is technical change. Wow. With that, that was a perfect wrap up. Uh, with that, I would like to say thank you for joining us tonight. Tafiq, thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule. Uh, to spend some time with us. This was an important and interesting conversation. Thank you all for joining me. And um, we will see you on the cloakroom stage. I think we have our next event next on the 14th of November, where we're uh, co-sponsoring with Scarla on an alumni panel. So with that, I bid you all farewell. Thanks again for joining us. And uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes in case anybody wants to, to talk. Thank you, right. Tofik. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. <laughs>